Today is Wednesday, July 2nd, 2003. This is the beginning of an interview with Mr. Irvin Daniels. Mr. Daniels uh, is a veteran of World War II. He served in the uh, U.S. Army in combat engineers. And he saw service in uh, Leyte, Okinawa, and Korea during the war. Occupation in Korea. Uh, Mr. Daniels, this is your story. We want you to tell it in your own way from the beginning of your enlistment. Did you enlist or were you drafted? And tell us if you were drafted, why you, uh, if you were enlisted, why did you decide to enlist? And then take us step by step from the date of your enlistment to your boot camp, to your permanent duty stations and to your overseas service and tell it in your own way. Will you begin, please? Okay. <clears throat> I uh, joined the Army in 1943 uh, and I was assigned to Fort Belvoir, Virginia, which is a combat engineering center uh, and went through training uh, which included learning many aspects of uh, what engineers do in combat as well as in uh, non-combat stations. Uh, frankly, I enjoyed the training, one, because I was good at it, and I was one of the few that took the trouble to read the manual to learn how, and because I had the desire to move up in the service, uh, especially to go to uh, officer candidate school. I was undoubtedly in my platoon uh, among the top two or three trainees and was recognized as such. One of the accomplishments that I had uh, that to many of the officers and non-coms who were training us was that I had the highest shooting score on record for the whole battalion. And they couldn't figure out how a New York City kid learned to shoot like that. So when I won the contest among the battalion shooters, uh, I was given various prizes, a three-day leave of absence, but the officers called me over and asked me, where did I learn to shoot? And my first inclination was to go into an explanation of the fact that I always, uh, as a kid, I loved to shoot baskets, and I was very good at that, but I didn't play very well. But I could sink to three-pointers without any problem. And anything that involved hitting a target, uh, I love to do. And the net result is that when we were in out to shoot for record, uh, I had learned a trick that helped me, and that was to heat rocks in a fire. Put them in my coat pocket. We were shooting in the dead of winter, so that was an additional aggravation. And before I was called up to the line, we had to shoot in eight different uh, distances and slow and rapid fire, I would put my hands on the rocks so that they wouldn't stiffen up on me. And uh, I had read the manual and I had zeroed my rifle in so that I knew it was the best that could be done with it. When I got to the last position, one of the other trainees <coughs> came up to me and he said, look, he said, if you can get 10 bullseyes, you're going to win. I said, leave me alone because this is nerve-wracking. Now you're telling me I have to be perfect. Anyhow, the long and short of it was that this was 300 yards rapid fire. In other words, we had to get off 10 shots within 10, uh, eight shots within 10 seconds. And I followed the manual very closely and put all eight into the bullseye. 
when the target went up, there was tremendous shouting and hurrah and this and that. And that's when the officers called me over. I said, where did you learn to shoot? And my first inclination was to tell them about, you know, as a kid, I did this, I did that, and so on. But instead, I pointed to the platoon sergeant, and I said, he taught me. And the platoon sergeant just puffed up. He was so proud, and he'd gotten an accolade. From then on, he was my best platoon sergeant. Anyhow, I, um, at the end of my training, uh, I was asked to become an instructor, which I certainly did, and I really had no choice. That's what they wanted, that's what they got. And I liked training. I went through five cycles training recruits. Um, and one day, when I was about to leave, go on leave, I was called into uh, the colonel's office and told that I was to be uh, confined to the base, no telephone calls, that they would follow up with me and tell me what was going on. So I pleaded my case to go on leave and I lost. And uh, about two days later, they called us together, told us to pack, and we were ordered to go to the railroad station in Washington and we were boarded a car um, that was all for us. There was no one else in it, 14 of us. And we ate and slept in that car and we slept on hammocks that we strung between the two baggage racks. This took me. And it took us five days across the country and uh, we eventually wound up in Hamilton Naval Base, uh, Air Force, it was a naval air base. Spent about four or five days there, um, and then boarded a luxury plane, which was full of a lot of brass, admirals, generals, colonels, and us. Uh, very luxurious. It happened to be my first time in an airplane, too. So we flew to Hawaii and um, spent five days being processed for uh, uh, duty in the Pacific, but especially in the tropics. And <clears throat> at the end of five days, we boarded a C-47 with the bucket seats. It was a jump plane. And we island hopped across the Pacific because the planes at that time could not make the journey at one swoop. So we went from there to um, uh, Johnson Island, Kwajalein, and it would talk Guam, and landed in uh, the Philippines, and reported to the uh, commanding general, the 24th Corps, and he said to, uh, to us, basically, uh, it's a little too late for you to do the training now, because we're going to embark on our next mission. And he said, uh, we'll take you with us. Um, so. Uh, they did. They put us on a transport, and about um, uh, four days later, we knew that we were going to the next invasion, and this was right behind the um, Iwo Jima. When you say they put you on a transport, what kind of transport it was, was that? It was a um, ship, ship transportation. And we were bundled into these pods, I call them, where 400 troops uh, used a single pod, and they had like 10 pods on the troop transport, 4,000 troops. And they were stacked five high, and it was so stifling that most of the troops uh, slept on deck rather than stay below. Because in addition to it being stifling, uh, you got sick. I mean, anyhow, on Easter Sunday morning, we were off the coast of Okinawa. We had been briefed by that time and told that we were going in and we were assigned to the 96th Infantry, which was one of the 24th Corps divisions. And the Japanese had a brilliant strategy of defending that island. 
And when we went in, there was no opposition. The Navy and Air Force and artillery <coughs> had thrown more armament uh, on to those beaches than was used in D-Day invasion or anything in history. And the naval armada was two or three times bigger than the tonnage used in D-Day. It was unbelievable. They have like eight battleships in a row just throwing these 600 pound lethal bombardment armament onto the shore. Anyhow, when we went in and found there were no Japanese, uh, they had wasted millions and millions of tons of ammunition. Uh, apparently our intelligence was not as good as I would have hoped it could be. Anyhow, the Japanese strategy was to bleed us to death. Up until then, <coughs> the strategy was they had the bonsai charges and other persuasive means, uh, but this time they decided that they would, they had a long time in which to fortify the cave positions, and they built miles and miles of tunnels and depots underground. And they were so brilliant in camouflage that you couldn't spot them if you were standing on them. So, initially, this was all done in the bottom third of the island. The island was 60 miles long and from 4 to 10 miles wide. One division went north, which was one of the marine divisions, I believe it was the 6th, and they uh, took over the entire two-thirds of the island in two weeks. The other divisions turned south and immediately ran into what the Japanese had planned for them. The short of it is that it took 82 days to control the island, or say it was under control, and our average forward advance was only 300 yards a day because we only had 14 miles to go, and it took 82 days. And the casualties, <clears throat> the casualties, especially with the naval forces, were overwhelming. Not overwhelming, but they were stupendous. The Navy, lost over 5,000 men killed. They had more than 12,000 injured. They lost 140 ships sunk and damaged. It far exceeded anything that we experienced in Pearl Harbor. And unfortunately, most Americans never heard of Okinawa and they ship. Can I stop you there? Sure. Yeah. Uh, when you were ready to leave the United States and go to the Pacific, did you leave family at home, a wife, a girlfriend, or whatever? Uh, no, my problem was <clears throat> my mother had been seriously ill for a number of years, and that was my biggest concern. And she lived in Pittsburgh while I was going to school in New York, and I went to Scott. I went to college on a city college scholarship, so I had no, nothing to pay, and I had uh, graduated, and then I uh, got a scholarship to go to the University of Pennsylvania <coughs> to the Wharton School. And since I graduated when I was only 20, I didn't have to get into the military until I was 21, and then subsequently they lowered it to 18. Um, I tried to <coughs> enlist in the Navy, uh, <laughs> um, it was, well actually I wanted to uh, enlist and go to OCS, Naval OCS, um, and I had a terrible experience in trying to do that. Um, so I, I left New York, went to Pittsburgh, and tried again because I figured that uh, I'd be more anonymous there. 
Um, Why well, did you want to join the Navy? I, um, <clears throat> I knew it was a lot cleaner living, for one thing. Also, I, you know, I'd always had a fantasy about ships and so on. But it probably was a mistake on my part because I was very subject to seasickness. But I thought I would outgrow it and get over it. <clears throat> but when I went to Pittsburgh on my second interview, after they turned me down in New York, I went to Pittsburgh and I was interviewed, I guess, by a regular um, Navy lieutenant. And he told me that I had failed the eye exam. Well, I knew I had 20 20 vision. And I proved it a year later when I was the highest ranking sharpshooter in the entire battalion. And I said to him, that, sir, that can't be right. I said, I have 20-20 vision. I don't wear glasses. I don't need them. I said, would you mind if I took the eye exam again? So this gruff officer called the medical officer over and whispered to him. And they, um, they, uh, he said to me, I read the second line from the bottom. And I looked at him and I said, you mean the second from the bottom? He says, yeah. He says, can you read it? I says, I'll try. Well, nobody can read the second line from the bottom. And so he went back and told the guy I failed again. Well, the truth of the matter is he didn't like my pedigree. Didn't like it at all. He was gruff, he was regular Navy, and there was still a lot of bigotry. He called, he said, you went to that communist school in New York? I said, for your information, sir, the school I went to had the largest voluntary ROTC infantry in the world, in the whole country. We had 2,000 uh, people in the ROTC, and I joined when I was a sophomore, so I could not get commissioned because I couldn't complete the four years. I said, but I did take uh, two years of ROTC there. Um, and then it turns out, he says to me, uh, where were you born? I said, New York City. He said, where were your parents born? I said, well, sir, to be honest with you, I don't know how that's relevant to our purpose here. He says, are you going to answer my question? I said, certainly. I said, uh, my grandfather came from uh, Latvia in 1905 because he, he escaped from the Russian uh, army. He, he had served four years and the war broke out with Japan and he escaped out of Russia at great risk, and then he sent for the family and brought them over, and that's how my um, uh, folks got to this country in the year 1905. Oh, he says, you're from Russia, a communist country. I said, sir, there were no communists ruling Russia. That was a czar, and he just didn't like our kind of folks, and the Cossacks would come through and chop heads. I said, so. He said, well, you flunked the eye exam twice. So that put me, and I decided I'd never again apply. And that's why I enlisted, I became a rookie, but they asked me to become an instructor, which I did. And I was, uh, now that I'd been through five courses and taught five, I knew I could go through OCS and not have to do, crack a book. So I applied again. And that's when they called me on a mission. So I had to cancel that. Anyhow, we got to Leyte and we were boarded ship. And we were standing off the coast of Okinawa. And that's when the first real heavy kamikaze attack occurred. And I can never understand to this day why the Japanese preferred going after the capital ships even though they did tremendous damage, why didn't they go after the transports? I mean, if they had sunk just our ship alone, it would have destroyed a whole division. 
And if they had sunk three transports, which were, had practically no defense, they had like a machine gun. But we did have, and they attacked at night, we did have um, our own planes protecting us. They shot down during the course of the invasion, uh, 1,100 kamikaze planes. Uh, in addition to 6,700 regular Air Force. But what happened when the, when the kamikazes came and started to attack our area, there was one kamikaze plane that was shot down and damaged, and it went in between two transports, ours and the one about a half mile from us, right in the middle. So every, all soldiers who had been on the top deck started to scramble and ran below. And I let them go. I didn't go down with them. And I said to myself, would you rather die in a hold of that damn ship or take your chances jumping into the water in case, you know, we get another attack? So I was the last man. They all ran below and I was at the uh, hatch and I was the last man and closed the hatch, except for about six inches to protect us from shrapnel. And I was able to watch what was going on. And this, occurred, this attack occurred when you were en route from the Philippines to Okinawa? No, we were anchored off Okinawa. You were anchored off water. Okinawa. We were due to uh, hit the beach the next morning. So when this happened, my brain said to me, don't go below. Number one, you get killed in a stampede by friendly forces. So I was the last man uh, down the hatch, and I stayed. Uh, the door was here, I stayed within five feet of it. And I said, if we're hit, I'm going over the side. I don't want to die below. That, that's how. So that was my first um, introduction. And then <clears throat> we was signed with the 96th Infantry, and when they turned toward the southern part of the island because of the cakewalk across, cut the island in two right away, in three, four days, if the Japanese chose not to defend it. And then they turned to pursue the Japanese in the last 14 miles, while one Marine Division went north and took care of business up there. Well, that's when they ran into all hell. And as I say, it took, um, it took 82 days to go to 14 miles. And uh, our job then was to <clears throat> instruct when possible and where possible, and also to maintain all bridging material and move it forward. As, we move, as the line moved, we moved with it so that there was always bridging material available. Well, the first When you say we, uh, what was this, a platoon no, or there, a company? There were 14 of us. Seven were sent north with the 6th Marine Division, and seven of us went with the south. Well, you were combat engineers. Yeah. We were stationed. Uh, we were only with the 96th Division for about uh, 10 days. Then we were transferred to the Marine 1st Division, which was a crack outfit. And we were, uh, we were with the 1st Marine Combat Engineer Company. We stayed with them. Uh, not that we did everything they did. We had our own job to do. But we bivouacked with them and moved with them. Um, anyhow, one day they called us and said, look, we've got an opportunity for you to train uh, the bridge builders. Fine, okay, that's what we were here for. So they took us to an area where there was a, um, well, you might call it a river. Uh, but our job then was to train them in putting a 70 foot span across the river. And you know, the Bailey Bridge is a cantilevered affair, and you have to figure out the weight so that when it tilted over and started coming down the other side where you'd already built an abutment for it, uh, you had to be precise 
if you sent it over without the proper weight being in back of it, it f fell into the river. So uh, I caught one, one officer who, to mathematics, was not too good. And before he was about to issue the order to tilt it, and I uh, said to him, wait a minute, you need to put on another bent, which is like another 1,200 pounds to get the proper uh, weight on it. So we went out with the Marines, and they at first resented it. They said, look, we built these things. We know how to build them. We don't need to, to go to school on this. They're pretty tough cookies. So we said, look, what we're going to show you is not how to build it. We're going to show you how to build them faster than you can imagine. And when you learn that, it'll save lives. So we went to work. We showed them our technique. Each one of us was responsible for a certain group and a certain function. And while we were building, the Japanese had spiders all over, wherever. And they spotted us and they called back to artillery and they started to shell. So every time, you know, there'd be a, four men carrying a 400 pound uh, piece. And when the shelling started, they had to drop it. And dropping 400 pounds, you had to be very careful in order to take your shelter. And we had to go through that three or four times during the building. But nevertheless, we built it in, in two-thirds of the time that they were used to building it, which meant, you know, life saved. So that was one of the things we did. Um, and how long were you on Okinawa? From beginning to the end. We were there. Um, <coughs> uh, we, Easter Sunday, first day, uh, we went with our company of engineers, uh, hit the beaches the first day, and fortunately, as I say, the Japanese did not resent it, uh, so that there were no, there were, I think there were only three killed in hitting the beach. Um, but the casualties, uh, as a result of the campaign, were far, far uh, greater than anything ever experienced before. Um, <clears throat> so we stayed there. When the campaign ended, we were way down the southern part, and then we were transferred from the Marines to the 7th Infantry, which is a crack outfit. Uh, and then our job was that we were going in with them in the invasion of the main island of Japan in the, I guess they call it the Tokyo Plan, uh, Plain. So that was our next port of call. And uh, uh, we were scheduled, the timing at that time to invade the main island was going to be about November. And we were in bivouac from uh, in July and August, September, uh, to be re-equipped and so on, and get rested and whatever. And then we would aboard ship for the next invasion. And other units were going to invade Kyushu and other islands of the mainland. Well, probably the second most dangerous day in my life in that combat area was the day that the war ended. And you say, how can that be? Well, the, um, when the atom bomb was dropped, there were five or six good reasons why it was done. And I guess there, forever there will be a chorus of nays and yays arguing, we should have, we shouldn't have, and so on. And I've studied this all these 60 years, came to the conclusion it had to be done. And one reason for the campaign in Okinawa and the results of that campaign, it showed that when the Japanese assume a defensive posture and board long tunnels and depots, they had their hospitals underground, they had the tank depot underground, everything was underground. 
Everything was zero. Every inch of space was pre-zeroed in for artillery. And it was just incredible. Well, the casualties, if you project that in going from an island 350 square miles into Japan, which was the size of California, you could project the death rate not only of combat, of military, but of Japanese. It would have been horrendous. I mean, it would have been, millions would have been killed. And uh, probably the Allies, because at that time the British also were starting to uh, join us, we, we probably would have had half a million killed at the minimum. And that was more than we had killed in all the wars in history. Um, so that was one of the reasons why they dropped the bomb. Okinawa told them, are you willing to lose this number of American and Allied lives and also millions of Japanese? Because the B-29s that firebombed the cities of Japan in one day killed more Japanese than both atom bombs combined. And most people don't know that because the cities were made of paper and bamboo and wood. And they dropped these fire bombs night after night after night. And now we had bases where the B-29s could fly in from the Philippines, from Okinawa, from uh, um, um, the little island where we got bloodied so badly. Um, and the Guam and so on. And so that was one of the main reasons why the bomb was dropped. Were you aware of these raids by B 29s? Oh, sure. At the time? How did you get the information? We had um, bulletins given to us about what was happening. Uh, also, throughout my military service, I had the uh, Week in Review section of the New York Times mm -hmm. mailed to me, even if it was a month old. So I always kept up, and I used to give the orientation lectures to the platoons also. And as a matter of fact, the uh, intelligence service interviewed me and wanted to know where I got my information from because they thought I knew something they didn't know. Well, the truth is I had predicted the day, for, I had pred predicted the day that D-Day was going to occur and they want to know how I knew that. All I did was took, I knew what the weather uh, option was. You had to invade between this date and that date, and I split it down the middle and I was right. I won $100 on bets and pools. So anyhow. You said the day the war ended was the day that you were in most danger. Right. Uh, can um, you expand I'm on that? I'm glad you things? reminded me of that, and I'll tell you why because in a sense it's, it's humorous. The troops were so elated. Everything that they had was fired. The guns went off. I mean, if you owned a machine gun, you fired it. And I looked around and I said, this, the ammunition's flying in all directions. And we no longer had foxholes, we were sleeping on cots. So when I saw what was happening, I ran into my tent. I took all the mattresses, piled them up, and crawled underneath. And who knows, that may have been my saying. Because, you know, a lot of people get killed in friendly fire. You know, as you see in what's going on now. The, um, I'll tell you one more other incident where I came very close. Um, we were dug in when we were the Marines on a very slope of a hill that was maybe 40 feet high. And we were on a very slope because it, it theoretically afforded protection against um, a shrapnel. So one day, Sergeant and I, we both agreed we needed haircuts. So I said, okay. He cut my hair first, and then I cut his. And he sat on a crate, and I was standing in back of him, shearing, talking away. And we could hear, you know, shells uh, maybe half a mile or so away, but we didn't pay any attention to him. 
And then suddenly I hear a whiz, and the branch of the tree that I was standing under falls down, and we both immediately knew what was happening. We hit the ground, and when it stopped, I saw a piece of shrapnel. As a matter of fact, I was looking for it last night. I couldn't find it because I brought it home. A piece of shrapnel about this big. And I've never seen a piece of shrapnel from a fired um, piece of armament. And the edges of it were serrated and razor sharp on all sides. And it missed me. I, I saw where the branch had been cut off. It missed me by about six inches. Just that. And I, picked, I went to pick the shrapnel up without thinking, and it was red hot, just blistered my fingers. And eventually, when it cooled down, I brought it back, brought it home. But that was a close call. And uh, anyhow, the, the campaign in Okinawa was in blood, material, everything was, was tremendous. But, So when you left Okinawa, where did you go? We, um, I had hoped that we would be assigned to occupation duty in Japan, uh, but that was not to be. Instead, they sent the 7th Infantry to uh, take over Korea. And this is, of course, in, uh, was in uh, September of 45. And uh, we went into Korea and the Japanese had occupied it for 40 years. Well, we landed at Incheon, that was where MacArthur made his famous diversionary incursion. Of course, you may remember it had a tremendous tide differential, 30 feet. But we, of course, went in at high tide and went in and um, we I don't know how I got there, but myself and another buddy, I guess we were assigned some time off, you might say, because we'd been on a ship for several days. And so this fellow and I just uh, went to a park in Seoul. No, yeah, no, in Incheon. Went to a park in Incheon and sat under a tree, and we both played the harmonica. And so the two of us are sitting there, and we're playing, you know, and a few children gathered around us. And they were smiling and dancing. And then we, we'd play Turkey in the Straw, and we'd play Yankee Doodle Dandy. And, and pretty soon we had 30 or 40 kids milling around. So I said to the guy, have you ever read the Pied Piper of Hamlin? And he says, yeah, that's a story about where they played the flute and the kids all followed them through the town. I says, yeah. I said, well, why don't we do that? So the two of us went parading through Incheon, and as we walked along, more and more kids joined. And pretty soon we had our own army of these little shavers. And we're playing them on, and that was, it was just hilarious. And um, another incident was, uh, Day we, day after we landed, we were uh, walking through Incheon, and we were starting to take over things. And there was a Japanese car park, and they had run out of fuel because the American Navy did a superb job, especially the submarines. They just sank everything, so they were short of fuel. So they converted to charcoal burners. It stunk like hell, but it got them places. And inside the car was a Japanese major, and he looked at, there were six of us, or eight of us, he looked at us with a look of disdain, and you could tell the hatred that came out of this man's face. So most of the boys that were with me were Texans, big and brawny, and uh, one of them got a brilliant idea. He said, uh, why don't we teach this guy a lesson? I said, well, what do you have in mind? He said, let's pick up his damn little car and turn it upside down and lock him in there. And he did. 
And this major was screaming, yelling, and we just locked him in there, walked away. And I don't know how long it took to get him rescued, but that, that was hilarious. We really enjoyed that. So, so your duty in uh, Korea was with occupation forces, is that right? Yes, we took over um, a Japanese, what was called a cavalry uh, installation. And it was a permanent installation, it had been there for about 40 years, well built. And um, I was given, not immediately, but uh, after a while, I was given complete charge of all divisional engineering supplies, which included the food and all that. And I had learned that a lot of the better stuff never reached us. Because every beach master, wherever the ship docked, would examine the manifest, and if he saw that you had smoked turkey in tins, he wanted that, or whatever was good. And we wound up with the K rations, the C rations. And this is doing combat, too. I mean, these, you see these um, amphibian tractors coming down with the rations for the combat troops, and there was nothing in there but the good old spam and all that junk. And the good stuff, the beach masters had taken off in Hawaii and wherever else they stopped, they sort of through. So I said, we're going to get ours this time. So I had about these same Texan boys. Uh, some of them were real good thieves. And I said to them, here's what we're going to do. We would drive down to the depot. I said, I'm going to get the master sergeant that runs this place. And he and I are going to have a nice conversation. And he says, while I'm keeping him busy, you guys look around and see what special stuff there may be around. And don't be bashful, just put it on our truck. So I got a hold of the guy in charge of the depot, and we became fast buddies. And I promised him a souvenir, and because uh, I was also in charge of collecting all the uh, troops, Japanese troops, um, uh, their personal guns, swords, which is where I got this from. And so uh, these guys loaded us up pretty good, and. Uh, I took some, some of that stuff, and the colonel in charge of our uh, battalion, he entertained quite well. He had a beautiful house there in the Korean hills, and he had parties. And he would come down and he'd say, um, Sergeant, what do you got for me? He says, I've got a party. We're going to have some geisha girls or whatever. I said, well, Colonel, you're just in time. And I kept a, a locked bin. And I opened the bin, I said, no, look around, tell me what you want. And I'd have a crate of Washington apples, and I had uh, uh, corned beef and all that stuff. And he just selected it, and we delivered it. And he was my pal. So We've got about 15 more minutes, so. OK. The, uh, <clears throat> Take us from from uh, Korea back to the United States. Okay. Hitting the uh, most important points you want to make. The return to the United States for mustering out was done on a point basis, and these points were allocated based on how long you're in service, uh, your rank, and also combat experience whether you went in with initial uh, wave or whether you were in supply. Uh, in other words, points for all that you contributed. And so when my time came, we boarded ship. Whereas I had flown across the Pacific, I was now going home on a ship. And this was pretty nice. And I was, my duty on the ship was that I was in charge of the bakery which was nice because they made beautiful pies and so on. But um, it was 11 days getting home and one of the highlights was that there was a non-stop poker game 
that went on for 11 days. And the winner, when we finally docked, walked out with $14,000. So I think he did the most. Uh, other than the, the Marines that used to uh, uh, collect Japanese gold teeth, uh, which I didn't mention in this, but there were some ne'er-do-wells that after the shooting moved forward, some of these guys would go into the caves, pull out the dead Japanese, and extract uh, whatever gold teeth they had. And I counted one guy, because I was mad about it. I thought that was a terrible thing to do. Uh, one guy had a pouch, and he had about, at that time, it would be worth maybe $300 worth of gold. And I said, for this, you're doing that? Well, he, he in fact, uh, told me, go mind your own business. And I did, because these guys, were, some of them were half nuts anyhow, you know, after being in several campaigns. So the ship, the trip back was great. It was 11 days, like a cruise. And uh, when I got back to, I think it was, uh, not Seattle, Fort Lewis in Washington, and they greeted us at the dock, and there was, a, you know, uh, how do you do? Glad to have you back, and they waving the girls and this and that. And they served us, the Red Cross, first time I'd ever seen them. The Red Cross came over and handed out milk, which was a bad mistake, because we had not tasted milk in a year. And it made me sick as anything. Uh, but anyhow, so we went to the USO after we were checked in. And guess what? The building started to shake. There was an earthquake tremor. That was our reading home. And then uh, um, we did fly from Washington back to the East Coast. And I was mustered out at uh, Four dicks. And uh, that was the end of that. And then I went back to school and finished up in seven months instead of a year. I got my first job at the ripe old age of 28. <laughs> well, Mr. Daniels, we have certainly enjoyed you uh, sharing your experience with us. Uh, is there something that if uh, a young person came to you today and asked you about uh, your military experience, what would you tell him, the, what you gained from that experience? Well, what I would tell young people, and I've told so many now, is you've got to know your history. If you don't know the past, you know, the old adage, you're bound to make the same mistakes again. And I would tell them history is a very interesting subject. I mean, read what you enjoy reading in history, pay attention, and today, unfortunately, you can get through half it and never take a course in history. It's terrible. Um, and in my recitation here, even though I've written it down, I did not go into the horror. I really did not. Because if I gave you the, the number of casualties and what I experienced as grave registration, it, it'd be you know, a terrible thing to talk about. We understand. Well, thank you very much. Uh, this has been an interview with Mr. Irvin Daniel, who was in the service during World War II. The interview was conducted at the Atlanta History Center in Atlanta, Georgia. My name is Frederick Wallace. I was the interviewer. Thank you very much, Mr. Daniel. Thank you. And, uh, you know,